Good evening and welcome everyone. This is Seth McGowan, Vice President of the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory, and I'll be your host this evening. The Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory is proud to present the next installment of our Cygnus series. This series of live virtual and interactive educational presentations takes place each Friday night at 7 p.m. And we've developed this Cygnus series in a way that will help continue our educational programming during this period of social distancing and limited gatherings. We hope to see you again in person soon, but until then, please register each week for a new and exciting program. In that same spirit, we have now conquered our live virtual and interactive stargazing, except for the weather aspect of it. We had a launch uh, just a few nights ago and the weather did not cooperate with us. Uh, fortunately, all of our technology was working perfectly and the next opportunity we will broadcast live uh, from our roll off roof observatory right here in the heart of the Adirondack Mountains. For those of you new to the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory, you'll notice our location is great for astronomy and a perfect location for an Astro Science Center given our class four Bortle skies. But that's not all. We are currently under development and it'll become an important designation, uh, uh, important destination for all ages in the future. Numerous interactive exhibits, exhibits with the museum will educate and thrill visitors as well as us Earth being uh, as we continue our exploration into space. In addition to the exhibit hall and continuing our hands-on approach to astronomy is our interactive hands-on learning lab where visitors will engage in virtual reality, telescope building, and so much more. Our spacious auditorium will be a great place for larger groups to hear about the wonders of space, and our premier planetarium will take you on trips beyond your wildest imagination. We invite you to be part of this exciting future by becoming a member of the Adirondack Sky Center and Observatory, and consider a gift to help make the Astro Science Center a reality. We are in the capital campaign phase now, uh, looking at raising the full amount uh, about $15 million for the Astro Science Center. And uh, we have a number of levels of donation available, um, including some naming opportunities. If you're interested or know someone who's interested, please pass along our contact information, which I will provide you with in just a little while. One programming note, next week we will take a week off from our Cygnus series, but we'll be back on Friday, September 11th with part two of Eileen O'Donoghue's Einstein Gravity and Multi-Messenger Astronomy. So now on for tonight's show. Before we start, you'll notice that microphones are muted. This is to ensure the enjoyment of all who are with us uh, tonight and allow dogs and other animals to bark freely in the background while you enjoy our presentation. <laughs> Feel free to use the chat feature to ask questions during the lecture. Uh, and if your question's not answered during the presentation, there will be a question and answer period that'll take place immediately following. If, uh, if your question is uh, pertinent to the particular topic, uh, I'll ask you to unmute yourself and uh, we can ask, allow you to ask your questions live. Tonight's presentation, as well as all of our presentations, are available uh, the following day on our YouTube channel. You'll be provided with that link and others referred to tonight uh, in the chat area, so be sure to jot those down. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Meg Thatcher, the Senior Laboratory Instructor for the Astronomy Department uh, at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. Meg has written 30 science articles for kids' magazines, and her first book, Stargazing, comes out October this year. Hope to hear more about that uh, in a little while. Tonight's presentation, Our Marvelous Moon. Meg, welcome and take it away. Thank you so much, Seth. Let's see. Oh, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready with the share screen like we practiced, but here we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so welcome everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, to join you all. Um, so tonight's talk is Our Marvelous Moon. And as Seth said in his kind introduction, I work at Smith College, which is in Northampton, Massachusetts. I am a laboratory instructor and I teach students, uh, mostly non-science majors, 
about observational astronomy. So how to observe the sky, how the stars and the sun and the moon move in the sky, the roots of our calendar systems, how telescopes and binoculars and everything work. Um, it's really a lot of fun and I can't believe that they pay me for it. Um, in addition to that, just in case you were wondering why the heck I am here, uh, my husband's family has a place in Racket Lake. And so that's my connection to the Adirondack Sky Center. Um, when I am not teaching astronomy to college students, I'm writing about astronomy for kids. And here's the, here's, here's the shameless plug. Um, I have a book coming out on October 2020, but of course you can, you can pre-order it anytime you want. Um, it's called Sky Gazing. And as you can see, it is a guide to the moon, sun, planet, stars, eclipses, constellations. I always forget the, the order of all of those subtitles. Um, it's a book for kids from nine to 14 years old. Um, and it's about how to observe all of those objects in the sky with your naked eye from wherever you are, day or night. So if you're in a light polluted place, there are activities for you to do. If you don't wanna go out at night and you wanna go observe during the day, then there's lots of stuff to do in this as well and activities that parents and kids can do together. But enough of that, let's talk about the moon. So um, tonight I'm going to tell you a little bit about the moon. This is a series of photos that were taken by Frank Espanic, um, who used to be a, um, he used to work for NASA. He's called Mr. Eclipse. He used to do their calculations for eclipses and he took photos, of, he still takes photos of eclipses. And so this is just a series every single day for an entire cycle of the moon. And you can see the moon starting out small and getting bigger. And now it's disappeared because this is the new moon. So this is an entire moon phase cycle. You can see this is the very first picture we started with. This is all those same pictures. And you can see it changing and growing and getting bigger. And so I'm going to ask a question of everybody. And if you know the answer, you can unmute yourself and just shout out the answer. We don't need to raise hands and stuff. So this shape of the moon right up here on the top, does anybody know what that shape is called? Crescent? Yes, all right, so this is called a crescent moon. Does anyone know what this shape is called? This is a less familiar word. So everybody knows crescent, but what is this? Ibis. It's more than half and not quite full. Sorry, I didn't hear that, go ahead. Gibbous. Gibbous. Very good. All right. We've got people. This is, this is a word that's only used in astronomy as far as I know. So it's a very special word. Um, you'll notice, though, that there are crescents on the top row, but there are also crescents on the bottom row. So how do we tell the difference between the crescents on the top and the crescents on the bottom? Um, you'll notice that, and same thing with the gibbouses. There are gibbouses up here and there are gibbouses down here. So we have to be able to distinguish them from each other. So when this one is, you can see it's growing and getting bigger. We call that, does anybody know this vocabulary word? Um, so um, when it's getting bigger, it's called waxing. Very good. What about when it's getting smaller? Uh, Wean waning very good we have a moon expert out there or two or three all right so these are all waxing crescents waxing gibbous and then down here is waning crescent or sorry waning gibbous and then waning crescent remember this period this this moon phase cycle takes 29 and a half days that's about a month because and and moon and month have the same root in old english all right, there are also a couple of other special times in this moon phase cycle. Of course, we have the full moon right over here on the left. Uh, and then we have a couple of times when the moon is only half lit. Some people call that a half moon, and that's totally fine, but astronomers call this the first quarter moon when it's lit up on the half. And you can see it's one quarter of the way through the moon phase cycle. 
that's about a week. That's about seven days from the new moon. And then the full moon is about two weeks. We could call that the second quarter if we wanted, but that would be silly and no one would know what the heck you were talking about. And then this last one that's half lit up is called the third quarter because it's three quarters of the way through the moon phase cycle. So the moon does this every 29 and a half days, all the time, all year. And it's been doing that for a long time. Oh, and I forgot there's one other special phase, which is new, obviously. Um, it doesn't show up because who wants to take a picture of a new moon, right? All right, so why does the moon go through phases? Why does it change shape like this? Well, hopefully no one will be surprised when I tell you the Earth goes around the sun. So this is a picture of this little blue guy is the Earth and it's going around. Anybody know what this circle is called, that the, the path that the Earth takes around the sun? Orbit. It's an orbit, exactly right, and it takes one year for the Earth to go all the way around the sun. And then the, the, the moon also goes around the Earth. So both of these things happen. And when, when, as the moon goes around the Earth, it changes position compared to us and the sun so we can see different parts of it lit up. And I'm gonna show you that. Here is the Earth again and the moon, and we're looking down on the top of the moon's orbit See, I've put these little things down here that say not to scale. So the moon is about one quarter the size of the Earth. And the moon would be much, 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 much farther away. We wouldn't be able to make a really nice picture. So I've decided to shrink the orbit of the moon just so that we can show this. And even worse, the sun is super far away. It's, it's going to be off to the left. Um, like a couple miles away in this picture. So instead of putting the sun, I'm just gonna put the sun's rays. So this is the light from the sun coming in and hitting the moon and the earth. And you notice in the solar system, the sun is the only source of light. Everything else is dark, we're in outer space. That doesn't usually happen on earth. And what happens here is it lights up one side of the moon and the other side of the moon is dark. Same thing with the Earth. One side is light. This is the side that is daytime. And we rotate around into the nighttime side of the Earth. So if we were here sitting on Earth and we were looking up at the moon, we would see that the moon is completely dark. And here's the way it would look in the sky. This is the sky. So this is how it looks in space on the left and how it looks in the sky on the right. And that's called the new moon. You see, I, I, I drew a really, really faint circle here so you could sort of see that there was a moon there, but you can't see the moon. We're looking at the dark side of it. So this is the new moon. When the moon moves a little bit in its orbit, this is like three or four days. If we look from the earth to the moon, you can see that most of it is dark and a little tiny bit of it is lit up and that is going to look like this. And again, it's the crescent moon. And because it's getting bigger, it used to be not lit up, and now it's lit up, it's the waning crescent. If we keep going another three or four days, we're going to look at the moon, and you can see that from Earth, you can only see this part of the moon the, the above, above this line. Half of it is dark half of it is light. In fact, if you turned yourself upside down and you were looking at it, you would see that the right-hand side of it is lit up and the left-hand side is dark. And that's our first quarter. Keep going in your orbit and we will get a gibbous moon lit up on the right and getting bigger. So it is our waxing gibbous. When the moon is over here, halfway through its cycle, halfway around its orbit, about two weeks from new moon, if we look up, you can see we're on the night side of the Earth now. We were on the day side before when we could see the moon. Now we're looking at the moon and it's all completely lit up. So it looks like a big circle in the sky and you all know that that's called full. Keep going more in our orbit and we get a waning gibbous moon, and then third quarter, and then waning crescent, and then we're back to new again, 
and it keeps going. That's why it's called the moon phase cycle. So cycle means it goes around and around and around and around and it keeps repeating. Cycle and circle also are related words just like moon and month are. All right, so that's what causes the phases of the moon. When can we see the moon? So if you wanna go and look up at the moon, and you look on your calendar and it says, hmm, the moon is full. When are you going to go out and look for it? So here's a table that will tell you. The new moon rises when the sun rises and it sets when the sun sets. So that means it's up all day. The full moon rises when the sun sets and it sets when the sun rises. This is because the new moon is in the same direction as the sun, so it does everything the sun does, and the full moon is in the opposite direction to the sun, so it does everything opposite. So it rises when the sun sets, and it sets when the sun rises. The first quarter moon is going to rise at noon and set at midnight. That means it's up half the time that it's up. It's up during the day. And the third quarter will rise at midnight and set at noon. All right, and do we have a question? I thought I saw your hand raised. Um, um, so, what, so, we, Earth actually has two moons, but keeps, like, our second moon, the farthest away one. It's, like, as small as a car, and it keeps waning away from Earth, so someday it won't be our moon. That's exactly right. So we accidentally captured a meteoroid, whoops. And instead of crashing into us, it just went into orbit around us and eventually it's going to go away. But the moon, the, the, the moon with a capital M, the one that we've always had, we're gonna have that for a very, very long time. All right. So, oh, sorry, forgot to point out that you can see the moon during the day. Look, if it rises at midnight, and then sets at noon, that means the third quarter moon is gonna be up in the morning. Huh. Okay, so if you can't see the moon at night, make sure to check during the day because has anybody ever seen the moon during the day? These guys have. Uh, Ben's photo blog and Mike Daniels. I always, I always used to show, oh good, we got some thumbs up. Thumbs up if you've seen the moon during the day. Most people don't notice it because the, um, the sky is really, really bright during the day and the moon is pretty faint compared to it. When it's nighttime, the sky is really dark. So the moon, there's a lot more contrast between the moon and the sky. So you can see it a lot better. Plus the sun's not up, you know, it's not confusing us with its light. So look for the moon during the day for sure. Um, if you want to observe the moon, here are some helpful hints. Remember, you've got already know the times when the moon rises and sets. Remember that it rises in the east, just like everything, just like the sun, just like stars. Stars also rise in the east-ish. So the moon will rise a little bit north of due east and a little bit south of due east, depending on what time of year it is and what phase the moon is in. But look towards the east to find the moon rising. Look towards the west to see the moon setting. And the moon reaches its highest point in its path. When, it's, when it reaches that highest point, it is due south in the Northern Hemisphere. So if you live in the Northern Hemisphere, you will only see the moon in the east and the west and the south. You'll never see it due north. Uh, it's the opposite in the Southern Hemisphere. All right, and the moon rises, it doesn't just rise you know, uh, at sunrise and set at sunset for a week and then suddenly change to rising at noon and setting at midnight, the moon rises 50 minutes earlier each day. So that's 55 -0. Oh. So don't look for the moon at the same time every day either. Look for it in the daytime as well as the night. So a really fun way to observe the moon is to keep a moon diary. 
A moon diary, seriously, is just go and find a spiral notebook that you used to use for school and rip out all your schoolwork and leave the blank pages in. And you can decorate it on the front or whatever. And every time you see the moon, well, maybe just once a day, every time you see the moon, you can draw a picture of the shape of the moon and what kinds of markings you see, all the craters and different stuff that are on the moon. Um, make sure if you are going to be a careful observer, all good observers will note the date and the time when they saw whatever thing it was that they saw. If it's flowers, or if you're studying lizards, or if you're studying the weather, or if you're studying the moon, always draw or always write down the date and time. And also, in this case, where the moon is in the sky. So is it in the east or the west? Is it high? Is it low? You can also observe the moon with binoculars. And so one of the things I do at Smith is I run observing nights and I always show people stuff through telescopes. And I love to stand next to the moon telescope because nobody ever wants to come and look through the telescope at the moon because they're like, whatever, I can see the moon, it's right there. I wanna use the telescope for really faint stuff that you can't see with your naked eye. The moon is boring. And then they look through the telescope and they go, <gasps> so you should definitely look at the moon with binoculars because you can see all kinds of detail. It is so different with binoculars than it is with your naked eye. So you can see all these different things. Yeah, what are these different things? Okay, so this is a, this is a view of the moon through, the, through, the, uh, through a telescope and you can see craters. So craters, it looks like somebody threw a rock at the moon and, and bashed a hole in it. And that's almost exactly what happened. Uh, our solar system threw rocks at the moon. Um, big meteoroids came and hit the moon and they make this kind of hole. And if, they, uh, if it's a really big rock that hits, they'll also, um, some of the material that the meteor dislodges when it hits the moon, will go out here in, in, in ray patterns that are like, this looks like the sun with some rays coming out of it. This is really just like rock and dust that got splashed out of the crater when the meteor hit the moon. These dark patches here, this dark patch here is called a mare. I know it looks like mare, but it's a Latin word. It's called mare, it means ocean or sea. Um, ancient people looked up at the moon and they thought that these were oceans, these dark things. So we're working in a different language. Mare, one, there's one mare, or you can have two maria. So that's more astronomy vocabulary for today. For today. I think that's it for the astronomy vocabulary, if you were keeping track. So you can see all of these things if you use your binoculars, and you can see them much clearer. And if you look at different phases, you will see different craters. So here is the full moon on the left, and on the right, we've got a little crescent moon, a little waxing crescent, and you can see all of these little craters here on the bottom that you cannot see on the full moon. That's kind of cool. Here's another one where, see this bright crater here looks completely different when you look at a waxing gibbous moon. And these craters here, you can see more craters. You see, you can see some on the left and some in the middle and some that are on the, on the right. You can see them at different times of the month. You can also see that this thing here, this mare, it's called mare imbrium. It actually has a lot of mountains around the edge of it that you couldn't see when it was full. You'll notice that the best view of the craters comes when you look right here at this imaginary line between light and dark. That line there, oh, I was wrong. One more, one more astronomy vocabulary word. This line between light and dark is called, does anybody know what that word is called? What's that? Terminator. The Terminator. We love that. I totally love that it's the Terminator. We make all kinds of Terminator jokes and stuff. I'll be back. All right, so if you look there, that line between light and dark, if you were sitting on the moon, that would be either sunrise or sunset. 
So the shadows are very long, so you can see the craters better. So keep that in mind when you're looking with binoculars. There's one other really cool thing you can see if you look at the moon with binoculars, and that's this. If you look at a crescent moon, sometimes you can see the dark side. This is called earth shine because you know that the sun is lighting up the crescent part of the, of the moon, right? The thing that's lighting up this part of the moon is the earth. If you were on the moon looking back at the earth, you would see a gibbous earth and it would be casting a lot of light and it would light up this dark side of the moon. So that's a really cool thing to look for when you're looking with binoculars too. All right, so humans are really, really fascinated with the moon. Why is that? Why is the moon so important? And this is where I'm gonna answer some of the questions that were, that were in the little description. Oh, wait a minute, we have one more question. Yep. Um, so the Earth um, is much um, like lighter from the moons. So I think it's like mainly um, it will get farther. Um, the light will trap, have a farther at the moon and it might take longer for that to happen on the moon. Um, I'm not sure which thing you're talking about. So the moon, the moon is much, much, much bigger. Uh, sorry, the, the earth looks much, much bigger from the moon than the moon does from the earth because it's four times as big. So imagine having a moon that's like four times bigger. It's gonna be shining a lot of light, yes. But you're right, it also is getting farther and farther. So in a few billion years, it will be very far away from the Earth. And we'll see just a tiny little moon. And the moon will see a tiny little Earth. And eventually it might go away. But that's, don't worry, that's billions of years from now, you're fine. All right, so why is the moon important? Well, the cycle is regular and it's predictable. It's always 29 and a half days, always, always, always. So you can use it to count time. It causes the tides. So if you can predict when the tides are, that's great. You know when to go digging for clams. You know when is the best time to take your boat out and, and when's the best time to take your boat in. You know when it's time to move off the beach because the ocean is gonna come in and, and knock over your buckets and sand castles. Uh, the moon, for our ancestors, the moon provided a lot of light at night. They didn't have street lights, so they would use the moon. If they wanted to go hunting at night or if they wanted to go visit the next cave, they could use the moon as their street lamp. Um, and it really helps when you're counting the days, the number of days in a season, so you know what time of year it is and you know what's going to happen in nature. Our ancestors hunted and they planted, and so they really had to know what was going on uh, in nature. So September's full moon is called the full corn moon, okay? Because that's when the corn gets ripe. Has, anybody, has everybody been eating corn? I hope so. I've been eating lots and lots of corn lately. All right, so you know that, that September September's full moon is the corn moon because we're getting lots of corn. So where does this term come from? It must be like super ancient, right? Like ancient people called it the corn moon and yeah. Okay, so this term comes from the old far farmer's almanac and this is a picture from the old fa farmer's almanac's ancient website. Uh, so it's really not that, they're, they're not ancient terms. So the Farmer's Almanac names all of these different moons. We've got the wolf moon and the snow moon and the worm moon, right? Um, those names are taken from more ancient sources. I believe the wolf moon and the snow and the cold moon are all from European traditions because when uh, the Farmer's Almanac was first written, it was in colonial American times. And so some of the people's ancestors came from uh, Europe. And so they used some European names for the full moons. 
But when they came over, they found things that they didn't have in Europe. There were completely different plants and different animals. So you'll have the full sturgeon moon and the beaver moon and the corn moon. Those are when different things are happening. This is when the sturgeons lay their eggs. This is when uh, the full beaver moon is when the, the beavers are starting to, are, are really finishing up their dams and going into hibernation. So this, is, this was the way that our ancestors kept track of uh, what was going on in the physical world. They took mostly Native American names and mostly since this is from the New England and New York area, they took Algonquin names. So you may have noticed that there are 12 moons in this picture. There are usually about 12 full moons in one year. But if you check my math, you'll find out that we don't get a year. If you have 12 moons times 29.5 days in between each full moon, you only come out to 354 days. But a year is 365 days, so we're 11 days short. And what that means is about every three years or so, we will have 13 full moons in a year. And that's one of the reasons that 13 was considered an unlucky number. Because usually we have 12 full moons, but then when we have a 13th full moon, ooh, that's weird, that's strange, it's probably unlucky. Um, interestingly, some societies thought that 13 was a lucky thing because it was rare. So who knows? All right, these are some other names for, for the moons. These come from uh, different Native American traditions. We've got some uh, uh, from the Sioux Nation. I think the Thunder Moon is, is uh, Sioux, anyway. So they're all different names, but you can see that they're also all based on what's happening in nature. So this is how our, this is basically a big calendar for our ancestors. But there are some other weird moon names that don't have to do with nature. There's a blue moon, black moon, blood moon, super micro, black, super moon, blue blood. Moon. There are all kinds of crazy names for moons. So I'm gonna explain what a couple of those are. The blue moon, um, one of the meanings of blue moon is if you, if you ever, have ever heard someone say, oh, that'll only happen once in a blue moon, it means very rare or doesn't happen at all. Um, but what it really is, is a blue moon. All those other moons have names. They, we have 12 names for moons. So the 13th full moon in a year is called the blue moon because it doesn't have a regular name because it can, it can happen anytime during the year. So in the early 1800s, it meant the third full moon in a season containing four full moons. On average, there are three full moons in a season. Um, and since the 1940s, it has meant a second full moon in a calendar month. Yeah, who cares about those details? The 13th full moon in a year is called the blue moon. Um, I wanna note though that the moon is not actually blue. All right. So when you hear someone say there's going to be a blue moon, don't get excited about the moon being blue. It just means that it's the second full moon in a month. Sorry. Uh, a black moon um, can mean the new moon, or it can mean the second new moon in a month or a third. Basically, it, it's like a, a blue moon. Someone decided that they felt really bad for the, for the new moon, that the the full moon gets all these special names and it's called a, a blue moon when there's a 13th. So they decided that a uh, black moon would be the 13th full moon, or sorry, 13th new moon of a year. Um, it can also mean a month that has no full moon. That can only happen to February because remember the moon cycle is 29 and a half days. A month is 30 or 31 days, you'll always have at least one full moon and one full moon cycle in a month, except for February. This only happens every 19 years. So really we should be saying once in a black moon, not once in a blue moon for something that's super rare. Weirdly enough, it can also mean a month that has no new moon. So either a month that has no full moon or a month that has no new moon, either way, it's always gonna be February. 
Um, but mostly uh, the black moon is something that people may have, have made up pretty recently. It's not an ancient thing like the blue moon or the sturgeon moon. A blood moon is definitely an ancient thing. Uh, this is a picture of a lunar eclipse. A lunar eclipse occurs when the full moon moves into the shadow of the earth and most of the light from the sun is blocked out. So you don't see a big white full moon, you'll see a red moon. And we can talk about that later if you want to, if you want to know why it's red, but this is what happens. And this was super scary to our ancestors. When the moon, the full moon was there and they're like going out and hunting and visiting the people in the other cave. And then all of a sudden the moon gets really dim and turns red. That was very scary for people. So they would call it a blood moon. Some societies thought that the moon was sick and that's why it turned red. And then my favorite, the super moon. So you hear a lot about super moons. I don't know why newspaper reporters get super excited about super moons, but I will explain to you what a super moon is. So remember I showed you that picture of the earth and the orbit of the moon going around it as a circle. It's not quite a circle. It is what's called an ellipse, which is a special mathematical kind of oval. Um, in this picture, we've really, really, really exaggerated how squashed the oval is. Really, it looks almost like a circle. Um, and when the moon is closest to the earth, that's called perigee. Para means close and g means earth. Um, as you can see, it's like 360,000 kilometers away. At apogee, when the moon is farthest, apo, from the earth, g, um, it's about 400,000 kilometers. So it's not actually too much different 360,000 versus 400,000 kilometers. Um, but when the moon is closer to the earth, I've got a, little, got a little moon here. When the moon is closer to the earth, it looks bigger. And when the moon is farther away from us, it looks smaller. So how much smaller? I'm glad you asked. This much smaller. So on the left, we have the super moon. That's the moon when it's closest to the earth. And on the right, we have, uh, sometimes people call this the micro moon. Uh, that's the moon when it's far at its farthest point from the earth. Um, and you can see they're about 15% different from each other. The super moon is about 7% larger than the regular full moon, the average full moon, and the micro moon is only 7% smaller than the full moon. So if it wasn't in the newspaper, most people would not notice that there was a super moon or a micro moon. So we've got all of these season names. So we've, we've got like the wolf moon and the, um, uh, the, the corn moon and the worm moon. We've got a blue moon, which is the 13th moon in a, a year, if we have a, a year with 13 moons. Uh, we have the super moon and the micro moon. We've got a blood moon. And so on the web, we see combinations of all of these things. A few years ago, there was a super blue blood moon. And all that means is it was the 13th moon of it. Well, it was the second moon in a month that made it blue. It was a blood moon that made it, that, that was because it was a lunar eclipse. And it was super because it happened to have an eclipse when it was closest to the earth. The, um, the moon is not always full when it's closest or farthest from the earth. So that's what makes it kind of a little bit special. For me, the best thing about the super blue blood moon was that it was a lunar eclipse and lunar eclipses are really cool. So uh, other than that, it was really just uh, a lot of hype. Um, so let me see. All right, so I think, what do you think, Seth? It is 740. 
Um, do we want to go a little bit farther or stop here and have questions? We could. Um, Allison actually had a question just a, a minute ago. Allison, oh, if, you, if you want to unmute yourself, this would be a perfect time for that question. Yeah, I was just wondering why, what causes the moon to turn red? Oh, good question. It just so happens that I was telling, I was telling Seth, I always have extra slides in my presentation. So everybody close your eyes. I'm going to get to the right slide. <laughs> All right. So what happens is in a lunar eclipse is uh, you've got the sun on the left here and then the, oh dear, is this? Uh, I can't, now I can't see. There we go. Oh, there we go. Yes. All right. I, I can't always see. When I can see all of you, I can't see um, my entire slide. So you've got the sun on the left and the earth in the middle and the moon on the right. So this normally would be a full moon. Uh, the reason for that is the moon is usually a little bit above or a little bit below where this shadow of the earth is. So the earth is casting a shadow called the umbra and it blocks out all the light from the moon, but, uh, or sorry, blocks out all the light from the sun. But remember that we have a little atmosphere and the atmosphere blocks out blue light preferentially. So it blocks out blue and green and yellow and it lets the red through. And so that's what's happening right now. Partly it's because um, the, the light is, being the the blue light is being blocked and the red light gets through and also partly because this atmosphere of ours is curved and it acts like a little bit of a lens and so the rays of the sun the those red rays that get through will end up on the moon it's very similar to what happens during moonrise or sunrise oh come on let me go through here there we go when the moon's rising this is a this is a series of pictures uh, taken probably two or three minutes apart. And you can see on the horizon, the moon looks very, very red because we're looking through more atmosphere when it's on the horizon. When it gets higher up in the sky, you can see that it turns white again. Has anybody ever seen the, the moon turn red at sunrise or sun, or sorry, at moonrise or moonset? Yeah. So that looks really cool. Um, keep watching it because most people are like, oh, the moon is red tonight. The moon is red for a couple of hours right after moonrise, um, which is also sunset. Um, and, and then it will, turn, it will turn white for the rest of the time. All right, other questions? Oh, I see a hand sort of raising, I can't tell. <laughs> if you have a question, go ahead and unmute yourself. Sometimes when we're driving and the the moon is rising and it's red and it's super huge on the horizon and then it and then, you know, as as it rises of course it gets smaller and smaller and smaller what makes it so big it's uh, not, it's well not a super moon or anything else like that it's just a regular moon but uh, this is usually what we're in Indiana, so I don't know whether being in the middle of the country does something to it or not. <laughs> no, it doesn't. So your moon look, rise looks like my moon rise, just the, the, the horizon looks different. You know, mine, mine isn't quite as flat. Uh, sorry, I used to live in the Midwest, so I really. <laughs> okay, so you'll notice, see this picture? The moon is the same size when it's on the horizon and when it's above the horizon. So the moon looking large when it's on the horizon is actually an optical illusion. It's our brains fooling us. Um, there are two possible explanations. This is great because like um, astronomers and psychiatrists or psychologists have looked into this and, and nobody has a definitive answer yet. One uh, possible explanation is when the moon is on the horizon, you can see it in context with lots of other stuff. You can see it right next to houses and buildings and, and things like that. Um, things that you know are really large and you see that the moon is larger than them, so you think the moon is huge. Um, the other is, and I, uh, 
I'm going to kick myself for not adding this particular slide. Look up a moon illusion and you will find um, there are some really great pictures of train tracks. You know, when you're when you're going down a road or when you're when you're looking down train tracks, they appear to come together on the horizon. So it looks like things are um, things appear to be smaller on the horizon when you know that they're really just the same size. So that could be another explanation for us thinking that the moon is bigger. It's very far away and you can tell it's far away because it's on the horizon. When it's up in the sky, you can't tell if it's close or if it's far, so you see it closer to its actual size or your, your brain can comprehend its actual size. And if you do not believe me, I encourage everybody to go out and look at the moon compared to your pinky. Hold your pinky at arm's length, right? So make sure your arm is completely straight and hold up your pinky next to the moon and see how many moons you think could fit into your pinky. And then do that when it's rising and do that when it's really high up in the sky. And you'll see that the moon is the same size when it's rising or setting and when it's high up in the sky. It's very bizarre though. I agree, it looks way bigger on the horizon. I just posted a link from uh, NASA on the moon illusion. Oh, great. In the chat area, so uh, everyone feel free to uh, look into that. Wonderful, thanks so much, Seth. You bet. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, let me see. Seth, I wanna make sure that we have time for people who drew pictures. Actually, we should ask that. Um, can people either raise their real hand or you can raise your, um, your pretend hand in, uh, you, can, you can either do a thumbs up or um, there's a little hand raise. If you, if you click on participants, you can see there's a little blue, a little thing will come up on the right, the right of your, uh, of your screen and it will show a little blue hand. You can click on that and to raise your hand or you can just raise your real hand. Um, so if you are a person who did the, made a picture from the moon, raise your hand. And then Seth, I can't see everybody, so you're gonna have to tell me how many people are raised. All right, I think I see like two. So I'm gonna take a few more questions and then in about, what do you say, five minutes. In five minutes, anybody who has a moon story to share and a moon picture to share will be sharing that, but I will take, I can take five minutes more of questions if people still have them. I literally, I'm in my basement in my office and I literally have a cricket chirping. <laughs> so I ask for questions and I get this chirp, chirp, chirp. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't have planned that better. Oh my goodness, that's so funny. All right, so no more questions, Seth? Uh, it doesn't seem like that unless people are having difficulty unmuting. And if you are, you certainly send me a message. Uh, we 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 do have a question again. Feel free to uh, uh, un, unmute yourself if you'd like to ask the question yourself. We have a very well behaved and polite group of people, <laughs> but it's okay to just shout out your question. <laughs> uh, this uh, this question is: Has anyone ever witnessed an impact in the moon? <gasps> yes, actually, yes. Uh, two eclipses ago, I can't remember the date. Um, but there was, it, 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 there's a really, really cool picture on the web, and I'm going to have to rely on Seth to find this again. So during a lunar eclipse, um, a, a piece of space junk, or not, not space junk, a, a piece of space rock crashed into the moon. And, and the reason it was so exciting was because lots and lots of people all over the world were taking pictures of the moon all at the same time. So tons of people got, the, got pictures of this moon, of of this meteoroid impacting the moon, it was really cool. They just there was just a really bright spot for a really really short amount of time. 
Um, also, I believe, now I can't remember the name of, of the um, spacecraft, I'm sorry, but there was a spacecraft that was orbiting the moon and it dropped something on the moon, like on purpose. It, it dropped a piece of itself and uh, took pictures as the thing went down and as it impacted. And it also, they, uh, NASA at the time, I think it was a NASA satellite, uh, encouraged people to take pictures of it. They told them when it was gonna happen and they said, take pictures and see if you can, if you can see the impact. Um, and it was not as bright as people thought that it was going to be. So there weren't as many pictures. So that's the other reason that this, this um, lunar eclipse uh, impact was really cool. So yes, the answer is yes, uh, people have seen impacts on the moon. Obviously nothing as big as what made these uh, giant Maria right here, but, but it's still kind of cool. It's like history in the making. And we see new craters all the time. Yes, there's another question over here. I don't have a name for you, sorry. Go ahead. So, um, can you see like, um, can you like see like, are there like footsteps like, like, um, when you, you're on a muddy beach trail, and also, can you like see um, in a telescope from Earth? I did not get your question at all. My speaker is being really weird for me. Just a second, let me turn the speaker on. Oof. Footprints of the astronauts. Love her in. See, and I thought about this before I started my talk, too. But I was going to need to do this. All right. There we go. The speakers in my laptop are really, really awful. So go ahead and ask that question again. I've got the good speakers on this time. So um, after, like, astronauts, um, so is it, like, um, can you see footprints on the moon and can you see them um, from Earth in a telescope? Uh, good question. No, you cannot see the uh, footprints from Earth. Um, they're just too small, not with, the, not with the telescopes that we have, they're too tiny. Um, I'm trying to think what's the biggest the biggest crater that you can see. It's, it's a, a kilometer or more is the biggest crater that you can see with most telescopes. Um, so footprints are way smaller than that. You know, they're, they're like a third of a meter. So that's much smaller than a kilometer. Um, you can't see the little rovers. You can't, because they left rovers behind. Um, and you can't see the American flag and you can't see any of the golf balls that they hit around there. But if you went to the moon, and you looked at the places where the astronauts landed, you would see their footprints. They would still be there because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. So on earth, if you make footprints on the ground, um, they get rained on or the wind blows them away or other people come along and put their little footprints on top of your footprints and that doesn't happen on the moon. So those really cool uh, astronaut footprints that we see pictures of, those are still there on the moon. You can't see them from Earth, but if you went to the moon, you would be able to see them. And I hope you all get to go and see the see them on the moon one of these days. That would be super cool. Okay. Hey, we have a we, we do have a couple of questions from uh, some apparently shy uh, participants. So I'll ask. <laughs> them. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, which crater has the reflector where they send the radar beam up to determine that? Uh, the distance from the Earth to the Moon, and the Moon is, in fact, going away. I do not know. I'm so sorry. I, did, <laughs> like, I should have just that. like gotten a big book of Moon facts when, <laughs> when I did this. I'm so sorry. But you bring up a really good point, which is we know the distance to the Moon very, very, very precisely. We know its orbit really well, partly because of radar. You can just send a radio signal to the Moon, and it bounces back off the moon and, and comes to um, and, and comes back to Earth. 
and you just figure out how much time it takes to do that. And we know how fast light travels and you can figure out exactly how far away the moon is. So that's how we know. Um, but yes, what you're talking about is there's a little reflector and we aim a laser beam at that mm -hmm. uh, to, to find it. So I'm sorry, I don't know which crater it is. I've never seen a picture or anything that indicates that particular location. Ooh, I wonder if that's on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> There's a conspiracy in there somewhere, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you. I believe the first reflector was in the first Apollo mission, and the uh, McDowell Observatory in Texas was the location of the laser beam that they first used. So if you look up where tra Tranquility Base was, that's where one of the reflectors is. Fantastic. Well, Tranquility Base is in Mare Tranquillitatis, and I don't remember which, which one that is. Um, so, oh, sorry, here we go. We're going backwards again. Yeah, it's one of these Maria. I think it's this guy, is this one? Tranquility. Oh, somebody gave me a thumbs up. Yes. <laughs> the only, the only Mare I know is this guy, Chrysium. Just this little, little cute little one. Um, so these are, these have really great names. So uh, Mare Tranquillitatis means Sea of Tranquility and Mare Chrysium means the Sea of Crises. And it's all, um, the moon was associated with dreams. And so you've got, you know, like the, the, the Sea of Humors and the Sea of Serenity and the Sea of Tranquility and the Sea of, um, Oh, there are all kinds of other fun. It's 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 really great. The ocean of the ocean of dreams. They're really neat names. Meg, somebody wants to know uh, what the origin of the word moon is. Oh, good question. Um, it is Old English, which comes from Old Germanic, and I believe it is moon. Um, in in German, the word is Mond, M O N D. Um, so they're, they're related to each other, but so they, they come from the same, the, the word month and the word moon come from the same, probably Indo-European root. Um, but I would guess that the Indo-European root is like moon or mond or something, or, or moon, something like that. Um, but yes, it comes from the old English. Can, uh, and Mary DeGarmo asks if you can point out where the moon landing was and explain why that site was chosen. Oh, gracious. You know what? I've got these in my book. So just a second. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Cause this is a, this is a fun thing. Uh, and it also, you know, <clears throat> I'm not going to lie. It gives me a chance to plug my book again. All right. Here's the sun. Here's the moon. So I've got a moon map here. Um, oh shoot, did we not put them in? No, we must have put them in. There we go. Serenitatis. Nope, we don't have them. Oh, that's really interesting. I thought that we did. Well, we've got the Apollo 11 landing site. It's right in, it's, it's right in the crease of the book. And of course, now you can't hear me because I'm holding this up. So I'm going to point to it on my thing. This is, we had a lot of trouble with this because I, I, I gave my editor a map and then it got translated incorrectly. And so it is right about there. So this is the Apollo 11 landing site. Um, all of the Apollo sites, except for the very last one, which I believe was 17, all of them landed in these, uh, these maria because the maria have fewer craters. And so the terrain was flatter and they figured it would be easier to land. But after they had done 11, 12, not 13, 14, 15, 16, um, the geologist on the Apollo team said, I want to go somewhere other than maria because they're all geologically similar to each other. They've all got the same kind of rocks. I want to look at different kinds of rocks. And I do not remember where they landed, but it was in one of these, you know, white parts, not the, not the black parts. And so they got to look at, at different types of rocks and it was amazing for them um, because 
this is really recently dredged up. The way that the Maria were formed was large rocks um, very long ago in the, in the history of the solar system bashed into the moon and broke through the crust and lava welled up. So these areas are actually younger because they've been resurfaced by new material from inside the moon. So these areas are, are, are pretty recent compared to, whoops, that's, that's my moon story. Oh, there we go, ah, there's my moon facts. Um, these white areas are much older than the, the darker areas. If only we had a video of those <laughs> All right, Seth is giving me a hard time because, let me see, I want to, oh, I don't know. I don't want people to see my terrible background here. All right, so I stopped my screen share and I've got a video of how the craters formed. It's two minutes as you, oh no, as you can't see because now I'm not sharing my screen still. Da, 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 da. Too many technical difficulties, too many technical things. All right. So here is a video from NASA of the moon long, long, long ago. So about like four and a half billion years ago, um, a planet crashed into the earth and some of the material splashed off and that formed our moon and it formed into a sphere. And suddenly a whole bunch of rocks came. This is one really giant uh, uh, mare that happened. And now this is, this is the, the part of the video that I love the best. Doom. All of a sudden you have all of these giant space rocks that are heading for the moon. By the way, this is not in real time. This happened over about 2 billion years um, that, that all of these were made. And you can see already we are starting to make the patterns that we see on the moon today. These are the maria and we have some volcanic activity where all of this lava is coming up and filling them in. And then meanwhile, the whole rest of the moon is still getting pelted with lots of meteoroids. And you're gonna, you're gonna see that in a minute, you'll see more of those. So these guys sort of cool down and you see this beautiful pattern, wait, it doesn't look right. What's wrong with this? So we need more meteors to come and make more and more craters. All right, so this is sort of the, the middle age of the moon, that was its youth. And the middle age is, is going to give us more craters. And this makes the patterns that you can see on the moon now. That really great big one that just, that just hit was Copernicus crater. And there we go. Now we've got our moon. Um, I don't know why, but NASA loves to show the, this view of the moon. This is not a view of the moon that you will ever see. This over here on the left is the dark side, or not the dark side. Gosh, I can't believe I just said that. The far side of the moon that we don't see. This part uh, on, the, on the right is uh, the part that we do see. So this is like a view from outer space. I wish they would just rotate it at the, as the last step, they would rotate it and show that you can see all the craters and the, and the maria that we can see now. But anyway, that's how the, that's how the craters and the maria formed. Oh, whoops, oh, here, here we go. Stop sharing that and I don't know, should I continue and, sharing or we'll go to the next thing? Uh, Jean has been, uh, she's got her hand raised, Jean Vincent can unmute if you have a question or you. Yeah, this, this is probably a silly question, but it's still. My favorite kind. Well, you know, <laughs> is there a man in the moon? And if there isn't, why do we think there is? And how huh. did it get started? The same reason that we think that there is a dipper in the sky. So humans really, really like, oh, geez, there we go. Um, Humans love to make patterns. It starts when we are first born, um, when we can distinguish a human face. Kids, uh, like babies as, as little as three days old, uh, can distinguish a human face from other things. And they can, they can look at patterns that look like two eyes and a nose and a mouth. And 
they smile or they, or they actually, they, they um, drink their milk. And if they see something that's wrong, they don't drink their milk. So we can, we can tell that, that humans are hardwired to see patterns in things. All right, let me show you this. Uh, this was one of the things that I gave to our younger viewers. Um, here we go. I gave them this lovely picture of the moon and said, join up all of these dark areas that you can see and, and see what, uh, what it looks like to you, because it looks like different things to different people and to, to, to different cultures. So just like we connect stars and, and make them into patterns, we also connect the dark patches, the Maria on the moon. And some of us see, whoops, see the man in the moon. All right, so, so this is one eye and this is another eye. And this Mare is the nose and this Mare is the, is the mouth. Usually he kind of looks like, to me, he looks like he's going, oh, but this, this is our happy version. Uh, these are all from National Geographic, by the way. Um, here's our blank moon again. And uh, the, so that's, this is pretty much a European um, and, and American version. Um, and then the Chinese and Asian cultures see a bunny in the moon. So if you look back here, these are two ears and here's the bunny's head and here's the bunny's body and the bunny has, and here are his legs, I think. And he's got, um, here's some arms and he's got a little mortar and pestle and he is pounding rice to make mochi um, and uh, so in China, there is a moon festival where you eat moon cakes, which, is made, which are made out of pounded rice. Um, and then in India, it looks like uh, they see a hand here and a hand over here. I sometimes see that when I'm, when I'm looking at the moon, I go, oh, that's the hands. Now I get it. Um, and the myth of that was the, the moon's mother, as he was sending, uh, as she was sending the moon uh, or, or her, her child up to be the moon, she put her hands on his face um, and the handprints are still, are still there. So those are just three. There are a lot. Um, and let me see, the share your moon story. What I see is also a rabbit, but I see this is the head and these are the ears and the rabbit is hopping. Here are the hind legs and the front legs. And that's why I love Mari Chrissium, because it's the bunny's little tail. <laughs> so that's a, that's a rabbit leaping. I think there are a couple of um, Native American tribes that see it as a rabbit like that, um, but most see it as these are the ears, not, not back legs. I can see that, Meg. So yes, there is a man in the moon, not a real man. Um, but yeah, we, we see it because people just love patterns. All right, before our evening uh, ends, I just want to add a couple of things to our group chat um, that you'll have. Um, one, once again, my contact information, uh, my email address, uh, sethmcg at adirondackskycenter.org. And my personal cell phone number, in case anybody is interested in um, a, uh, a sizable donation, naming opportunities, and being a member or part of our um, capital campaign in particular. But uh, some of these can be done through our website as well, adirondackskycenter.org, our Facebook page, and our YouTube channel will, will have a, uh, the full video of uh, Meg's presentation. Uh, from tonight. Uh, that'll be within 24 hours, maybe even before I go to bed tonight. <laughs> and if I can add, you know, my, my voice to that, I visited the Adirondack Sky Center and it is an amazing place. It's this giant building where like the whole roof rolls off and you've got, how many, how many telescopes do you have in there, Seth? We've got four permanently mounted telescopes. Um, it's crazy. And they have a whole bunch of other telescopes that they throw out into a field. And I just can only imagine if, if they do this much 
with this one little tiny building and four telescopes, which are very nice telescopes, but I can't even imagine what you would do with an entire giant building and an observa another observatory and yeah. So yeah. give them your money, they will use it wisely. Very exciting. <laughs> uh, finally, I, I do want to remind you that next week we will take a week off and Friday, September 11th, we're back at seven o'clock with Eileen O'Donohue's uh, Einstein Gravity and Multi-Messenger Astronomy. And as participants tonight, you get the early registration link that I just included in the chat. I will include these also in uh, when I post the YouTube video tomorrow. So that's all I have. Do, uh, Meg, do we do we have anything else? Are we? Yes. If anybody wants to share their moon story, right. I would right. love to see those. So I think what we need to do is have everybody do speaker view. And then can you, will, can you allow um, anyone who's speaking to, or can you spotlight them? I believe so. Okay. So anybody who wants to show, I already showed you my picture of my bunny. My story about my bunny is that she was just a little bunny um, and she made friends with the moon rabbit. Um, but then the moon rabbit disappeared and it was very sad. But then he came back because the moon has a cycle. <laughs> All right, I know we had at least two people uh, who had moon cool. stories. There we go. Um, the kid who is probably not named Jeffrey. <laughs> or who has a parent named Jeffrey. Um, so. There we go. It looks like to us like a, a squirrel eating a nut and then a possum in my story. Awesome. Is, um, there was like. Do you want to hold that up again so a, we can see it? A walking squirrel and then it saw a paw print and then, and then at one point it came back and didn't see it and then it, it saw it and uh, I never. Here. Here's the squirrel. Here's the nut, and there's a paw print over here too. Uh huh. And the tail. I love the squirrel's tail. That's so great. And his little legs. I can totally see that. And then he also saw the sun down here. So we were pretty excited when you said it looked like the sun. Yep. Absolutely. And those things coming out are called rays. That's like the technical term. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Did we have another one? Oh, sorry. Was there somebody else? Got a couple of applause on that. Uh, yeah. Oh, I see one other kid. It looks like they're labeled Kelly Birth. Ah. <laughs> I bet that's, I bet your name isn't Kelly though. <laughs> Do you want to show us your picture? Oh, I'm not sure we can because it's, um, because it's dark. Yeah. But let's see if we can. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I think we're turning on a light. Either that or we're very shy. I'm not sure. How do you know? I think we're getting parental help. Okay. No, not right now. Are we going to see? Mm-hmm. It's going to say rotate 180 degrees. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. Oh, beautiful. I think I see another squirrel. Dragon. Yeah. Dragon. <gasps> oh, wow. No, I see that. Those are the wings. Those are the arms. And that's the head. That's the eye. Those are the feet. Now that's part of the tail. And there's more of the tail. I love the claws that you put on his front, front paws. Oh, that's awesome. Do you have a story about him, too? Or just you see a dragon? Just a picture. Oh, that's so cool. I'm now, I'm, I'm going to see a dragon and a squirrel whenever I look at the moon now. <laughs> Thank you both so much for sharing those. Excellent. Excellent. Do we think we have anybody else? 
Yeah. Yeah, I should do my little my little applause thing. <laughs> Here we go. Yay! <laughs> All, All right. right. Well, if there's no other questions, Meg, is there anything else you want to cover for tonight? I don't think so. I All think right. that, you know, with what I had and, and uh, the stories and all the questions. Well, thank you very much for uh, being with us tonight and uh, teaching us about the moon. And thank you, audience, for, uh, for being here tonight as well. I hope you're enjoying our Cygnus series. And you have my contact information. If you have any feedback or any thoughts um, and, and perhaps even some subjects that uh, you might like to see for future lectures. We'll be wrapping up uh, in mid-October the Cygnus series, but we'll continue some along throughout uh, the, the winter and into spring as well uh, from time to time. So if you have any thoughts, any feedback for us, we'd love to hear it. You can email me directly, uh, sethmcg at adirondackskycenter.org, or you've got my phone number too, so feel free to give me a call if you want to chat about astronomy, about the Cygnus series, or our capital campaign project. I'd be happy to talk to you uh, in brief or in at length about, uh, about any of those things. So, so thank you all very much. I hope you have a fantastic weekend and a good Labor Day weekend next weekend. And we'll see you back here on the 12th for Eileen O'Donohue, part two. Good night, everybody. Thanks, good night. <laughs>